All right, guys, happy hour. It's like really super close. But before, uh, before happy hour, we just wanted to uh, unlock, uh, I unlock, I'm reading the thing. We want to give you guys a chance to ask questions, answers, uh, ask us anything that you want, ask the team, ask us, ask us anything. We're going to open it up, and um, we'd love to hear, hear what questions you have. Yeah. What did you, sorry, um, what did you ask Tim Ferriss when you met him? Um. We asked Tim Ferriss about, um, one, about financing. Uh, so figuring out how to leverage other people's capital in order to grow the business. Um, and he gave us a lot of really great insight. He said, well, do you really want to use somebody else's capital? Because it's very expensive. Do you want like a 10x return? Back to that 10x number. <laughs> Um, and it gave us some, some perspective on, he said, it's not as glamorous as you think it is. So whether you get an outside uh, venture capitalist to, uh, to give you money, seed money, uh, raise a round, uh, or venture capital, he said, you're only looking at it at one light. Why don't you find out really where you want to go and then see your options from there? Because you're really limiting your options from, now, now I just realized, you asked me, what did we ask Tim Ferriss? And, I'm, and I said oh, that, and I'm telling him what he's saying back to us. That's what we asked him. <laughs> but tell we also you. asked him, um, yeah. so, a good thing I like to ask is like, what, what questions should we be asking? Mm -hmm. so, so sometimes we don't know what we don't know. So he, he's seen people at our stage before and has a better idea of what's coming. So instead of us trying to think, do we even know the questions, which we don't? It's like, what should we be asking? And he gave us some advice on what should we be asking him and then other mentors that were there. Sure. But back to the, back to the financing. You can get a loan from a bank. You can joint venture with somebody. You can uh, acquire somebody else's company that's not doing really well. Uh, you can go to other companies who are above you and say, hey, what if we fell into your organization and you fed us capital? Um, there's so many different ways to do it, um, but that's just one question that we asked. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, walked right into that one. Um, well, Christ, so it was more of the, like, where are you trying to go? He gave us some book, book ideas on, I forget. Getting everything you want out of. Getting as much as you can out of. Everything, you everything got. you've got. Something, yeah. He some book that I saw, I haven't read yet. It's about like the thigh masters and the marketing they used to. Yeah. 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 Um, I forget the name of it. I'll, I'll send you the. Well, we can put it in the. I'll put it in the best self unlocked. The list of books that that he gave us. Um, yeah. But uh, getting everything you want out of everything you got is by Jay Abraham. I know that much. Yeah. Okay. One hundred percent. Sure thing. Henda. So how do you create partnerships that make it a win-win? Um, so everyone in this room is hooked into the same radio station. It's called We FM, What's In It For Me. <laughs> and I feel like if you can, so for us, with when we do partnerships, we figure out what the other person, what the other, what's the outcome or the goal of whoever it is that we do a partnership with. It might be just getting in front of an audience, it might be a revenue goal, it might be whatever it is for them, and then figuring out how we make, how we get them to win so that we can win. Um, so figuring out what the goal is for the other person 
um, just by like having a converse, you know, having a conversation with where they're trying to go with their business or with their life or whatever it is, and then figure out how you make it a win for them so that when you ask them, it's like a no-brainer. And I'll give you an example. Um, uh, there was an influencer on YouTube that briefly, like seconds, mentioned the self-journal. But she's got a big audience and a big following. And my sister sent me the video and said, oh my gosh, here's your product uh, in this YouTube video. I follow her, blah, blah, blah. This is amazing. And I found the influencer's email. I emailed her. And I said, self journal, question mark, in, in the subject line. And I said, hey, I'd love to jump on a call with you and find out like, how you found it and this and that. And we ended up talking. And it turns out she wanted to transition from the area that she's in, in the niche in health, and uh, in the niche that she's in, which is health, and transition into business. I said, well, perfect. You know, we, we know a lot of business people. We, we have a lot of people uh, in, on our list that have to do with, uh, with business and growing their business and scaling. What if we you know, said, hey, look at our friend over here and see what she's doing in the business aspect, and you create custom content for us related around the journal, and then it feeds your audience back to ours. So we just found out, like Catherine said, what her end goal is. And then we said, perfect, here's how we can help you get there that much quicker. Uh, we have a question from the live feed. Ah, perfect. Um, Stay away. Here? Is this better? <laughs> um, so there's a lot of different types of productivity tips and tools and everything out there. How did you guys decide which elements to include in the self-journal? The question is, there's a lot of product to, oh, you've got the mic. <laughs> I thought you were just buying time. <laughs> um, so for us, we, like, we read a ton of books, and there's so many things out there. Uh, and there was stuff that we had in the in original like framework that we just took out of it because it wasn't helpful. So for us, it was more of a personal preference of, OK, we tried this. doesn't really work for us. This is what we like. And then since, since we put it out as an actual product, that Ellen and I actually created it for ourselves first. Since we put it out as a product, um, we take customer feedback as we apply things and, and see what actually works. So it started as Ellen and my personal preference over what we liked and what worked. And then it's kind of grown a little bit since then. Yeah, and an example of that. So um, started in a blank moleskin, transitioned to the self-journal. Self-journal version one had uh, the weekly breakout as far as uh, recapping your weeks in between every seven, seven days. So if you started on a Wednesday, that next Wednesday you have this weekly recap and you're like, it's Wednesday, why am I recapping my week? So we got customer feedback and we found out that the usage wasn't working because we want people to pick it up regardless of what day it is. We don't want them to wait for Sunday or Monday. So we took all those weekly recap pages and put them in the beginning of the journal. So now you have this fluent flow uh, throughout the entire thing and not interrupted. Any, anyone else? We got two questions. Yes. Uh, yeah, so you've consumed a lot of content in creating the culture here and within um, the Best Self Co. So um, two part question. What is the one book that started this journey for you or um, the piece of information that you came across, and then is there um, a piece of required reading that you've given to your team members that they should read to know more about what, what you do? Mm -hmm. um, so there's two books that I attribute a lot of my knowledge and how I operate on a daily basis. Uh, the first book is um, Success Principles by Jack Canfield. And I read the first one before there was even the social media aspect. He goes very deep into breaking big, ambitious goals down into bite-sized pieces. Um, and then there's a lot of other practical information inside that book. The second book, which is more of a methodology of how to operate and how to live your life, and I recommend it to everybody, is Outwitting the Devil by Napoleon Hill. 
and that book really changes your mindset to be intentional with your time, to be to have definite purpose rather than drift through life on some you know obscure path that you're on. Yeah, for me, I think um, uh, I just forgot it. Uh, essentialism was a was one that I read, which is just about cutting out everything that's that doesn't work, and then oh, that compound effect, which is all about compounding interest on the habits that you set up, and it's very like methodical in in creating the habits that you want for your life. And then as far as the team, we actually have a reading program uh, that we set up last year, which is we put a bunch of books in there around like personal development and. Um, stuff that we've read and approve and the team like if you want to read it you can we'll pay pay you by hour to read it and then you write a book report on how you're going to use what you learned in the book in your life or for the business it doesn't have to be for best self but we want the people that work for us to become their best self as they work for us so um, yeah there's a there's a lots of long it's a long list of books and they could cherry pick yeah captain mm -hmm. So the question is, what did you do in order to build a community that goes beyond the self-journal? It starts with the journal and goes beyond. The first thing we did was when we launched the Kickstarter, we, we kept interacting with the customers, the backers, and even the people who weren't backing who just had questions. Hey, will this work for this goal? How does this thing work? And we just kept t telling them and providing value for them. And when they provided value back as far as, hey, you should make this tweak, or hey, I downloaded the PDF and I saw this, we took their feedback and said, hey, by the way, we just want to let you know we removed this, or we added this, or we tweaked that. And they now felt a part of creating this process. Now, what happens is the Kickstarter is done, we have a business, we bring people in through our products, and what we do is now we cultivate a community on the back end, the Best Self Alliance, and that alliance is now the reason why people are staying, right? So we, bring, we come in with products and then we provide more value above and beyond what they think they're getting already. So they think they're gonna get a, a three month day planner, but oh my gosh, there's this whole other ecosystem behind here with content and people and tribes and oh, this person's actually my neighbor and I didn't even know they were into this type of thing. Yeah. And now you're, you're seeing um, the value add that's, that's happening there. And how we did it in the beginning was every day yeah. when Catherine and I, it was just Catherine and I there. in the beginning. We get were in, in there. <laughs> get in there and just publish every day. Provide some sort of value every day. And I think the difference uh, for us is that we were like selling a planner, but for us, like the real success is for people to actually use it mm. and to come back and like get another one. So for us, finding success using the product instead of us just selling it once and then, you know, it's like, oh great. We were like, okay, how do we make it easier for them to actually use it? How do we give them, you know, cause not everyone knows how to set a goal. Like there's, there's like three segments of people. There's one segment where we don't really need to help them because they, they pretty much can use the framework and go, go along with it. And then the other two segments need different varying versions of help. And I think by understanding the different segments and creating content served to the different people so that it doesn't matter where you came in from, we can help you regardless. Yes. I think just learning what is one leadership lesson that you can tell us? Um, I think for me, accepting the leadership position was a, uh, a thing at the start, but then everyone's motivated by different things. So um, there's different personality types, there's different, like whenever, when people come on board, I, we have them do like the Myers-Briggs, uh, the love languages, because we, we wanna know, okay, if, if you do a good job and your love language is words of affirmation, we can, we can be like, okay, we can make sure that we 
uh, reward you with words of affirmation, if it's um, uh, gifts. like gifts, we know. So it's really about what motivates people, how do we reward them properly, and then how do we give them like purpose within their, their role. So If it's um, physical touch, we're not done. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently there's a corporate version where they like change that, but um, yeah. We just don't go near that one. No, we just go, what's your second one? Yeah. What's your second love language? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, for me, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, what's the question? Uh, what's the leadership lesson? Leadership lesson. Uh, the leadership lesson, the biggest one that I've had and all of 2017 was me working on myself as a leader and a manager. So all I did in 2017 was figure out this thing called management and try to make it work because it was the only way to help us grow to the next level and impact more people because it was just being capped out at where we were. And I will say this, it is the hardest thing ever, <laughs> managing people. But it is also the most rewarding thing. And one book, I'll give you a book that was really transformative, was Eaters Leap Last by Simon Sinek. And what that book taught me was your team can only get bought in to what it is that you guys are doing so far. They can care about the business, they can care about the customers, they can care about the product, they can care about the mission, but it only goes so far and you need to come to them and find out what else they care about outside of work. And the term that keeps coming up for me recently is not a work-life balance, but a work-life harmony and that's what people care about now. How can I take the mission of the company, as far as employees, the people that you're managing, how can I take the mission of the company and integrate that in, in with my work, and how do I know that my work allows me to integrate that into my life? So when you're talking and having a, a chat with your employee or s someone that you manage, hey, we're, we're, we're working on this project, Great, it's going well, what other action items do we need? But also, how's everything else going? What's going on? What are you doing this weekend? What's happening in your life outside of work because there is a whole other life outside of work that impacts the work that's being done. And if you give a shit about other people's lives outside of the work in the business, they'll give a shit about the work inside. What time is it? Okay, two more questions. Uh, any? Yeah. You guys have worked with coaches before for different reasons. Um, could you each explain like one coaching experience that you found really useful? Um, something like that. Is that a easy to answer or a clear uh, clear enough question? Okay. Yeah, we both see, we actually both see coaches. We have coaches personally, uh, and then Al and I have a coach together. It's our um, marriage counseling, um, where we just, you know, stuff comes up and we go over, like we have our personal things and then we have the business things. So, you know, we can just come together once a month. And um, for the personal, it's like, with this coach specifically, uh, we created a, a current way of being, so how are we showing up in the world, and then how, what's our new way of being, and then each week he would set a, um, like an activity or something that we have to do that corresponds with the new way of being, um, and that's kind of what the whole coaching, coaching is, so we both, both did that and got a lot of value out of it, and you do it for, what's it, like an, an eight-week thing, and um, yeah. Can you just repeat the question again? I want to answer it to the best of it. Um, how do you feel that now that you have your coaching experience? Um, a useful thing that I've gotten out of the coaching experience. I think dovetailing what Catherine said was, hey, I've got this big thing that's been holding me back in my life, and in order to help me get to the next level, 
I need to strip it away or work on removing myself from it. And a coach will help you do that through the practices on a weekly, bi-weekly, monthly basis. So in, as you can imagine, being uh, an iso isolated entrepreneur working from a home office, communication isn't really my strong point. So Use when, your words, Alan. Yeah. I've said that many times. Use your words. <laughs> We're sitting, <laughs> I'm sitting there and Alan's just staring and I'm like, use your words, Alan. <laughs> so um, one thing that we work on is communication. How can I be a better communicator? Not only just orally, like here, but how can I express my feelings? How can I express really what I'm thinking and how, uh, and how can I do that articulately that doesn't affect or hurt other people? And that's, that's one yeah. big thing that I got out of it. All right. Oh, one more. one more. So when you guys started this whole thing, what was the largest, most seemingly insurmountable challenge that you faced, and how did you overcome it? What's the biggest challenge? Oh, goodness. Um, I feel like the level of challenges we've gotten, we've gotten so many challenges. Like, right after our Kickstarter, we um, were supposed to deliver. We promised people we'd get, they'd get it by Christmas time. And we're dealing with this awful um, freight forwarder, which delivers the, the um, products from the, the manufacturer. Yeah. And um, I've been asking them for weeks to send us like the date of schedule. And then finally, the, the, it's being picked up in four hours. And they're like, oh, it's getting in on Christmas Eve, which means there's no way. Like, it's going to, between like t um, customs and everything. And so I'm like freaking out. And <laughs> I'm going out. I'm like, this is awful. Let me just paint the picture. So it's 2 a.m. It's in the 2 a.m. <laughs> in November, <laughs> and uh, and we had promised all of our Kickstarter backers. And we didn't want to start our business on yeah. the like we promised you this, and we didn't make it happen. Yeah. And now this uh, freight forwarder is like, hey, we're not going to get there until Christmas, and because of the holiday, mm -hmm. probably into the New Year. I'm like, oh my gosh. So Catherine calls me up at 2 a.m. Uh, Houston. Hey, I'm dealing. Yeah, Houston. <laughs> we have a problem. Yeah. And uh, Alan, this is a great thing about having someone that you can call at two in the morning. He's like, "Well, it's a container, right? We can just, we can just." Alan just sends the stuff, and then it's supposed to happen. We can just put on another ship. <laughs> it's getting picked up in four hours, but somehow we're gonna find a ship in the next four hours that yeah. we can put this on and get it here in time. Yeah. And uh, we actually did manage that, <clears throat> funnily enough. But that was one of the things where I'm like, oh my God, we're never gonna overcome that. But at the time, it seemed like that was a huge problem. Whereas if that came up now, we'd be able to handle it really quickly. But we have uh, had other problems. We had another issue with fulfillment where our products were like held hostage in, in Europe over Black Friday. And so our level of, um, your level of problems will equal your level of success. So if we had got that problem when we first started, we wouldn't have been able to handle it because we didn't have the, the knowledge. So I think as you grow and as the business grows, your expertise in dealing with those type of problems grows and then the level of problem grows with it. So you go from, you know. One container to a whole fulfillment center being shut down. Yeah. To whatever the next one's gonna be. But uh, how we're able to deal with that is by pushing ourselves outside of our comfort zone constantly and just constantly pushing that level of what we're comfortable with. If we were only comfortable to handle that, that, uh, that first issue of, hey, uh, we're not gonna get the container by Christmas. Oh, you know, well now I gotta email all my customers and let them know that it's not coming. Yeah, yeah. or just not accepting, like yeah. looking for alternatives even if it seems unlikely. Um, it would have been easy for us to be like, oh, I guess we just won't get it. Um, but instead, we're like, no, we have to find another ship and we have to get this container onto another ship in China, even though we're here. And we managed to do it. And I feel like um, just ask, like, creating the possibility for doing something differently and not just accepting um, 
the normal, normal. Most people would just accept normal, but we won't. Best is our standard. Thank you, everyone. Right. We're good. All right.